tiger on the prowl. I'ma make it go wild. I'm original, and I told you so. I'm a kid in a candy store with the leather on the denim. I ain't the cure, I'm the venom. If you wanna find me, find the tail light. Something's coming in, you're gonna wanna take a red eye. It's time to go. It's time to go. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Don't blink, don't blink. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Don't blink, don't blink. I don't wait for nobody. I'm a summer name on the dotty. City lights call my name, drawn to the flame, and I'm feeling kind of naughty. I hit the ground running, step out the door and I'm stunning. Better hold tight, cause you know what's going down. I'm setting the pace, cause this is my town. So get ready, get ready, get ready. Hey friends, Keely Dunn, FHF Empires. I am not gonna be able to speak today, I can tell already. It is What Up Wednesday and you are the third team. And do I look a little different today? Yeah, um, I'm not feeling great, but I decided that I was gonna plow through this anyway. It may be a shorter show, but every time I say that, I am so wrong. I don't even think, like I, I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even, I'm just gonna jinx it. So we're just gonna have a show. I'm gonna talk about a few things. It's gonna be fine. It's gonna be absolutely fine. Uh, of those things that we're gonna cover today, we're gonna talk, oh, this has been all of the conversation over the last three days now, because this happened on Sunday, a standstill in indoor. We're gonna talk about it hopefully really, really, really briefly. Really briefly. That's. That's my ambition. We are gonna go through another scenario that happened this weekend, also an indoor that involved drilling. And for some reason, this was a controversial call. And um, we're, yeah, let's just cover it. Let's just talk about it. Again, hopefully it'll be really fast. There was a question posted on Twitter about whether indoor hockey might be too complex. I'd like to, you know, I'd like to chat with you guys about it. Why not? And then a couple of bully questions. So back to outdoor, although it could apply equally in indoor. And let's deal with those as well. But first, hey, you know what I don't have available right now? I don't have all of my beautiful comments. It's, uh, yeah, it's just one of those days. Wait a minute, oh, and I don't have my music playing? I mean, it's craziness, right? It's absolute craziness. I'm like, wait, is anybody, is anybody here? I don't have any, any comments going. Hang on. I can do this. I can do this on the fly. Here it is. Oh, what a relief to see your beautiful shining faces and your gorgeous avatars. Uh, <laughs> good to have you. Matt Sefton, there you go. Oh yes, you did order something. Thank you so much. That's gonna be great. I can't wait to hear what you think about it. I'm always open to feedback and I'm, merch is hard for me because I have very, very high standards and I want everything to be perfect. So I'm, I, I'm not super publicizing it because I just, I'm like, well, I wanna make sure everything's cool before it all goes out. So there you are. 
Rachel, you are a Merlot in the glass. Fantastic. Wow. Good morning. Happy caffeinating. Good to see you, Andrew. And good to see you too. Uh, BU13. Boys under 13. Right. Umpiring. I'm ready to go with tea. I have my tea as well. I have been drinking a lot of tea over the last five days now. Shane, hi. Good to have you. Sir, we'll be talking about your bully question later on. Glad that you're here to have it. Uh, Lou, fantastic. You've got more indoor. Well, great, because we're talking about a lot of indoor. Because I don't know if you're aware of this, but this past weekend it was the Bundesliga final and the Belgian final and Super Sixes in England, and it was the Hooked Class of Finals, and everybody played finals, except, you know, us. Because we're gonna play into March. Stain, hi. Great to have you. Mr. Pibworth of the Pibworth Rule is here, yes. I have to, I have to support the brand, but you don't wanna know what's underneath this. I'm just saying, it's not, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't go through the whole physical rigor more. It would have wiped me out perfectly. Yes, the product placement. Thank you, Yurian. Good to see you. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm glad that you were able to get out there on the court. That is great. Kyle, good to have you. Thomas, I've been calling you Tomas for so long because I, I literally thought you were Czech. I really did. I mean, why not, right? And maybe you are, maybe you are, and you're just living somewhere else. I'm not going to give away your location unless you want me to. Man, this is an awkward conversation that I'm having with myself. There you are. Uh, Mike Mack is here as well. And yes, I don't know what the deja vu is, but it's probably um, something that I'm repeating what I'm saying. This honestly, guys, let's just, let's just do this thing today. Let's just get through it. Okay. All right. So we did talk about the topics, but <laughs> before we move on to all of the fun stuff, yes. Um, Control Elevator, if you haven't signed up yet, uh, we've got a good stack of people showing up for this one. It's going to be fun. And it is very much a workshop format. So there's a lot of discussions going on. We work through a lot of video, talk over the concepts. And what I hope is that when you leave, you have some really great strategies to take you through a control elevator game so that you're whew, aces everything is brilliant for you i want to send out a welcome whoops i can press that button i can do this big welcome to roger it could be pives it could be peeves it could be something else I'm not sure. Roger, however I'm mispronouncing your last name, I'm so glad that you've joined up with, wait, can I, can I do that? No, I can't do that. I messed it up. I'm great. I'm very grateful to have you joining the FHU third team yellow. If you don't know what the Sam Hill I'm speaking of, it's this stuff right here. So green, the new green memberships, you get full access to the clip library, as well as just the joy and happiness of knowing that you're gonna pay for my medical bills. I'm just kidding. I have Canadian healthcare, I'm fine, but. <sighs> there you go. Yellow, $27 a month, and you receive a whole schwack of mentoring. If you wanna know more about that, like ask me, or even better, come into the Discord server and we can talk about it. And you can ask some of the people who are already in yellow and let them uh, regale you with stories of how much fun it is and then we do have our red association membership and again you can go find all of that gorgeous information at fhu3t.com it'll send you there and it would be great to have you okay enough of that enough of that there is a glitch in the stream oh was there a glitch in the stream oh that's fun uh, in the merch department is FH umpires <clears throat> going to start selling underwear. Sir. Wait, sir. What's the point? Nobody will ever see it. I think the only, the only place that would be even re remarkably on brand is if it was, but no, 
no, I'm just not. I'm just, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. What a shame. Thank you very much. Mod in the house, Dean Taylor, thank you very much for putting that link in there. I, I can do that too. Maybe not today though. Not today, Satan, not today. Okay, let's get on to our first topic. And yes, it's the one that everybody was speaking unto. This was the scene in somewhere. <laughs> I can't remember which hall it was in. It was Bloomendale playing Lauren. Division one relegation battle. So it was a, from what I understand and Google Translate could have totally been misleading me. It was a three team relegation pool between these two teams and the team that you saw pictured up in the stands called Ring Pass. And they were quite dismayed that for the last one minute and 30 seconds of this match that was ending and did end in a 4-3 win for Bloomingdale, I believe, that, the, that no actual hockey happened. Now, to be very clear, actually, I shouldn't say that because I'm making assumptions. My understanding is that up until this time, hockey had been played. So it wasn't as though the team stepped out for 40 minutes or whatever they're playing in the Netherlands because they're not playing by FIH rules. They did play. They just did not play once this scoreline had been achieved. So that meant that Ring Pass was assured to be relegated, which was obviously very dismaying and distressing for them. Totally understandable. And since this <laughs> clip and this news has been making the rounds, people have been losing their minds about this. I have seen uh, calls to hang and quarter the teams, uh, calls to hold the umpires responsible. Obviously, we're responsible for everything, so you know why wouldn't you? Calls, of course, to hold the administrators responsible. So what I, I don't want to go too far into the ethics of the situation because what we as umpires need to understand is that so long as the ball is played and put into play as it has been there, you can see that the ball is a little bit in the backfield and it had been touched. It's live, it's in play. As soon as that has happened, there is nothing for umpires to do. Our job is to enforce the rules, to ensure safety of all the participants and fairness between the two teams who are on the pitch. The integrity of this competition is not within our ambit. All we have are the rules and then whatever regulations might pertain to this particular competition. And there were no regulations requiring teams to try. So unquestionably, there was nothing for the umpires to do here. Now, is this pretty? Heck no. Is it the worst thing that I have ever seen in hockey in terms of good sport? No, <laughs> I've seen far worse that is still allowed. But one thing I wanted to present to you that you may not have seen after you saw all of the you know, hyperbolic conversation. And oh, and the, and the last follow-up is just that Ring Pass has requested an investigation to uh, occur into whether this was some form of match fixing under some Dutch rules, regulations, something like that. I'm really, really not sure. But here was something really interesting that was brought to my attention on uh, not our Discord server, but on a different Discord server, that uh, Darren Cheeseman, who is part of the Lauren coaching staff, but not the coach of this team, uh, wrote this message. And it was on his stories, so I can't, I can't prove to you that it was him because the screenshots were taken and then forwarded, and then um, obviously because it's a story, it's gone. But he offered a different perspective that I think has 
a great deal of merit. And he explains as he goes through this, and I, you know, it's it's very long. And if you want to see it, come into the Discord server, and I'll I'll pop all these screenshots in here. But he talks basically about how game theory, which is really what the core of sport is, actually supported these two teams in 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 the decisions that they made at the time that they made them. So what he explains is the fundamentals of the theory dictate that you must know the rules of the game, what opposition are likely to do, and then you can determine the best response so you can win. The next part is that you're able to also find the Nash equilibrium, never heard of this thing before, which is a sweet spot where it is a win-win for both parties playing. In invasion sports, it's rare that you get that Nash spot, but that's, uh, as Darren explains, that's what happened in this part. In this part and you know he says it wasn't spoken about prior to the game or even within it both teams are suddenly in a situation where they are not incentivized to change the result of the game either way and from his coach's perspective he says no matter how uncomfortable it was to see a team stand off and not press it makes sense why they would risk leaving a space for the opposition to score the same for the opposition who are not risking to attack as they may lose the ball and concede the goal that relegates them. So what he makes in a very, very eloquent and logical argument is what I sort of felt after this is like, don't hate the player, hate the game. Because this relegation pool structure was set up to allow this to happen. This is not the fault of the players or the coaches or the umpires. This rests solely on the administrators. And we can all understand that in a time of COVID and trying to adapt to limitations and scenarios and sudden cancellations and inability to travel and all that kind of thing, that maybe this was never the optimal type of competition to decide which of three teams gets relegated and in an ideal season this doesn't happen there's full playoffs and and there's stakes in every game and everything's fine it just didn't happen here and I think what we have to understand is that it's not for us to judge competitors in a competitive environment where there is not just you know recreational pride but there's a lot more on the line in this kind of level that they're doing what it took for them to succeed to win or to lose by only as many goals as would keep them up in that top division so that's what i have to say about that i'm interested to hear if you have any different thoughts on this and yeah i'll grab these screenshots and pop them in if you want to read it because i really do think it's worth thinking about it it helped me organize my thoughts a little bit more about this and i'm not saying justify but help bolster what i feel was the argument that you know what else can you ask for from competitors in this situation whose job is not to entertain anybody but to win Mr. Pebworth, similar, similar thing happened in the Olympics in badminton. Both teams wanted to lose to get an easier draw. Both teams got kicked out. Apparently there's a black card for not trying. Exactly, so in badminton, from what I understand, because I, I remember hearing about this in the past as well, there is a rule against not doing this. There is a um, passive play or, or anything like that, but we don't have that. We don't have that because it very rarely happens because we're usually good enough at structuring our competition that there's always something at stake. At the international level, there's ranking points at stake. There's seeding in the next year's competition. There's sometimes there is a, you know, a, a hint, a whiff of, oh, we'd rather cross over against this opponent that we weren't expecting to be in that uh, higher crossover place but it, it really doesn't happen very often so I can see where that is 
Stefan, Kia Aura, very good to see you, sir. All right, so I hope that settles it. I just also <laughs> I just want to remind us that it's really not our place. It's it's just not for umpires to 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 even worry about. When I'm coaching umpires at tournaments and there's all these extra things like there's rosters and there's draws and there's uniforms and all that kind of thing. And this can happen even in league situations as well, where there are technical or regulation type things going on, placements, points, draws, all that kind of stuff. I say, you know what, gang? We have 99 problems that all surround what happens within this big white box on the pitch. And to take away our focus from all of those things, all of those 99 things in there, is really a poor decision on our part. Because nobody else can decide what happens within that white box except us. So let's give our full focus and attention on that. And maybe we can chat about things for interest at another time, another place, whatever. But this one wasn't our fault, gang. Fantastic. Okay, let's move on to the next topic. This was also coming out of the Netherlands, and it was another, this was the final as well. Oh, Stefan has a statement, and I'm going to make sure I take a look at it before I move on. We don't want umpires doing this as then we bring in mercy rules and other things like that. Not good. Yeah, just not, not for us to decide. Not for this. I don't know. Oh, SEP is somebody else's problem. Yeah. And that's not an abdication or a, you know, or chickening out of something that should be our responsibility. It's like, no, <laughs> it's just, we don't have the tools. We don't have the tools. It's just not in there. Time was not being wasted. That is not time wasting. The time is fully being spent. Play is allowed to continue. It just didn't because of the choices of the players not to partake. That is not time wasting. Nothing to do. Okay. Here's the situation we're looking at. Okay. I'll play it a few times. For you. Now this came to my attention from the uh, FIH Academy coaches course that I'm in right now uh, for indoor hockey, and it, it it was really fascinating to listen to the coaches' perspectives on this play. But I'd like to hear from you first. What do you think about this? We are at a 4-4 tie with two-ish, uh, yeah, two-ish minutes left in the game. They don't stop time for anything. So they're not playing by FH um, rules. They have varied their pattern of competition play, which I always find is, is kind of interesting at the highest levels. I, I don't know quite why they do that. And I'm, I'm interested to hear what you think. In, uh, I'd like to say episode 28, but that's not the right way to, to refer to things. There we go. What is drilling in indoor hockey? So this was the, we covered this. We talked about this three weeks ago. And I will put a link. I will put a card or something like that up here, down there, something like that in the description. If you need to go back and have a look at this, because I probably spent about an hour dissecting what drilling is. And one of the points that I brought out that I don't think many of us are that cognizant of is that there's an, there's an or situation in this. So the guidance under 9.8 says that players where are we? Uh, playing the ball deliberately and hard into an opponent's stick, feet, or hands when the player is in a set or stationary position. 
or there's a turn and fire situation, that will constitute drilling and should be dealt with in that manner. So Lou, you're coming in with looks like drilling free hit defense, uh, uh, free push defense. I'd love to, to hear more about what it is that you're looking for here. What about this play is it? Because um, I agree. And I'm going to tell you what I started hearing back about this particular decision later once I have a few more pieces of input here. The decision on the court was that the ball had been misplayed by the defender up into his own leg and a penalty corner was awarded. And I actually have the whole Merkers en Schoenaker. Wellen krijgt ruimte, geeft dat hem niet. Dat is heel gevaarlijk wat Harry hem daar doet. En is het in het blok spelen of niet? Oké, okay, ik hear the fans going crazy. Sorry, I'm going to mute that so that we can talk over it. Thank you very much, Simon. Simon's put in the comments the link to the drilling session. And it was a session, wasn't it? It wasn't just a flirtation with drilling. It was a session. It was all of the things. Okay. Blue. Inside playing distance. So around three meters. Seems to check forward movement as the offense pushes. Okay. So that's a couple things. Chris, let me hear it. Uh, oh, it does. Um, it deflects. It, it comes off the defender's stick. Up into his leg. Okay. That's so close to the line between set and not set by the defender as they are moving in through re-drilling. Okay, Chris, <laughs> we talked about this three weeks ago as well, right? Stationary does not equal set. Set does not equal stationary. If it did, it would be an and conjunction, not or. Those are two separate, distinct concepts, according to the rules. So what constitutes set? Because I think what we can all agree is that he wasn't stationary. And yeah, Lou, he, he did kind of check his movement. I think there's no question that he was hit within, you know, three meters. Well, actually, I, w I shouldn't say there's no question. When I look at the distances between the net ball line and the circle line and all that kind of stuff, to me, that's within three meters. Regardless of whether he's moving forward in that moment or not, that at the moment of impact, he is within three meters of the attacker. And Chris, you appreciate the or nature, but your point is he's barely arriving in the set position by the time the ball is released. Right. I guess what I think is important to acknowledge is that, again, the purpose of the drilling rule is to dissuade players from taking the chance that they're going to break somebody's hand or take out their teeth and taking this kind of chance. He's clearly being closed here. And that player decides to go for it anyway. He isn't getting closed from the side. That defender is coming from straight ahead, and he can see him. So he is taking that active risk. And whether he's half a meter away or, or, he's, or he's moving through that last meter, I don't care. He's close enough. He's absolutely close enough, OK? And I really do think that we have to separate those two concepts because it leads us down the wrong path because players aren't stationary most of the time in indoor hockey. And if you go back to the examples that I showed you back three weeks ago, 
there were times where a player's running alongside and she gets drilled because her position is set. She's nowhere near stationary. She's running alongside. And the player just decides, no, I'm just going to shove it right into her. I don't care. And that was carded. And I believe appropriately so. Because playing the ball at the opponent is terrible skill. And something that we are trying to get away from. Yeah, definitely high risk, high reward. Mm, Andrew, out of curiosity, um, do your fellow Kiwis winter team require goalkeeper? Okay. Good chat, good chat to have on the Discord. I like that. Freezing at the point of the ball with the attacker stick, defender stick is not flat or even near flat. Okay, so that's the argument that I was getting from the coaches. And I'm going to object, Mr. Pigworth, to your characterization of this not even being near flat. Okay. There is definitely a small space. Oh, my camera has turned off. Isn't that fun? Okay. Um, I'm going to try to keep talking <laughs> as this continues. Dina, we have to talk about this because I don't understand what's happening with my camera. But keep talking amongst yourselves. Listen to the music. Keep listening to the music. I'm going to keep talking very loudly. Very loudly. Keep talking amongst yourselves. Chris, I'm glad you saw the light. I wonder if I have to talk this loudly, actually. Don't even know. I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay, look at that. Presto. I knew that might happen, so I kind of had a scene backup ready to go. <laughs> we will get me sorted out. But you know what? 99 problems today, all of which involve me feeling like crap, and none of them being about that camera. It is pretty, though. It is a very pretty camera. Um, I need to wind it back a frame or two, says Luke. Okay, let's see if I can do that. Okay. That's where, that's where he is. When the ball is being released, okay? His glove is pretty much on the top of his shoe. So there's probably... I don't know, that much distance? Maybe something like that? Okay. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. That stick looks close enough to, the f to be flat to you. Yeah, and so this is the argument that I heard from the coaches is, well, his, his gloves, his knuckles aren't on the floor. That can't be drilling. He's not set. I'm like, just because you teach the skill that the best way to receive that ball or to tackle that ball is to have your knuckles on the ground doesn't mean that that is the guidance or that is a requirement for an umpire to deem the attempt to play that ball into that player as being dangerous. because he never should have tried it. You try that when the stick isn't down anywhere near it. Maybe. 
Maybe. But that, no, you don't have to be, you don't have to have great, perfect stick positioning in order for that to be drilling. You still deserve the protection of your, for your hands and your, your feet and your body. Like what happens if this, his left hand is a little bit up, knuckles aren't on the ground, but he drills more towards the defender's right foot where the stick is in full contact of the ground. Are you gonna, are those the centimeters that we're gonna be arguing about here as to whether this is drilling? Absolutely not. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> so funny. Okay, so I think there's a big difference between a player who is nowhere near having their stick down on the ground and that. Okay, that for me is still absolutely drilling, still absolutely dangerous. And yeah, and the call needed to go the other way. Unfortunately, this led to a penalty corner and it turned out to be the winning goal. If the Dutch translation of the FIH rules of hockey doesn't, requires it to be stationary and doesn't require set, then that's a mistake in the Dutch translation because you can't vary the interpretation of the rules. This is, fool! Okay, hang on. <clears throat> Let me try it again with the right scene queued up. And the sound effect didn't sound. There it did. It's really important for those minor details to be in sync. I can't, I can't think. Because this same thing happens in an international competition, it's not gonna be called the Dutch way. The Dutch way. There's no Dutch way, there's no Canadian way, there's no English way, there's no South African way. There is the rules of hockey, friends. So the Dutch translation needs to be updated. Could be an explanation. There's enough there for you to want to protect the defender. Yeah, even in slow-mo. Consciously playing the ball hard in the direction. This is the Belgian interpretation. In the direction of the stick, hands, feet, or a player with an increased ri risk, risk of energy when this player is in a low defensive position. Okay. So that's, that's even a little more liberal, you could argue than what the FIH rules require. Okay, and it does seem better. Yeah, I do like that. What is the spirit of the rule? What is the intention? It's not to, not to have some technical requirement about how a skill is executed. It's just to try to try st stop. Ugh. Yeah. Namaste. It's to try to protect the health of players. And it is an avoidable, a very avoidable. It, the ball doesn't come off the guy's stick and hit him because of a complete failure on his part to do his, to do, to do his part to, to, to receive that ball. Like I was saying, the attempt shouldn't even be made. That's not tactically a skillful decision in that moment. So I found it very interesting though, and maybe this explains some of the discussions that I have with coaches that their perception of how the game 
is played is so much around the execution of the skill that they impart that onto the actual interpretations that they expect umpires to be abiding by. When it, uh, our purpose or the rules purpose is not to enforce skill. In almost every case, it's not to enforce skill. We're not gonna talk about trapping Andor because that's like a crazy thing that doesn't have any purpose except to keep the game being pretty. The rules are there in almost every situation to keep players safe. When players argue with us that every foot should get called because you should have the skill to be able to play it, we don't care. We don't ca we're not here to judge whether skill was employed properly or not. We're here to keep players safe and to make sure it's fair between the two teams. That's it. And I shouldn't really say that's it because that's a big job. <laughs> I'm not, ugh, I shouldn't be reducing that. Okay. Yep, and that's possible. That's possible. The, the interesting part for me intellectually was hearing the argument that because the glove wasn't like on the ground, that there was a space of this much, that that's too much. And therefore it's okay to throw the ball right at the guy. So it can break his foot because he doesn't have his, his stick in his glove hand right in front of his foot protecting him. It's okay to break his foot even though the rules say specifically that you can't throw it into players' feet as well as their stick. We're not just protecting, we're not protecting sticks. Sticks don't feel any pain. We've gone over this. Bodies feel pain. Sticks don't go to the hospital, we do. Our faces go to the hospital. Our broken hands. I have a broken thumb from July 2nd, 2021, and it's still not better. And the ball barely hit me. <laughs> I was so mad. Hmm. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> Mike. I say so many things that I'm like, I really could have said that better. That's what I'm about. Okay, quarter to one. Things are going great. So after we've had this whole discussion about a couple of rules, this is what popped up on my Twitter feed that I wanted to, to talk with you guys about a little bit because I'd like to hear your thoughts as well. And uh, my friend Bernardo from South Pass wrote that one of his friends was completely entranced watching some indoor hockey in Germany. And oh my God, B loves his indoor. Loves his indoor. And he said after two matches, his friend was completely hooked, wants to watch more, but struggles to understand a lot of the rules and the technical, tactical specs of the game. I just love the speed and emotion. Interesting. And the, the, the implied argument out of this is that, you know, maybe it's just too, it's too hard. The rules are too hard. We should dumb them down. And I'm not, I'm not saying that Bernardo is specifically making this argument, but it's something that one could interpret. And, and many people make this argument. You'll hear commentators talk about how this is too complicated and, oh, we just need to simplify the rule book and, and all this kind of thing because it's just too hard. So I was in England when the Rugby World Cup was happening back in, I don't know, 2007, 2008. I know you guys will be able to tell me. And as a Canadian, not a big rugby place around here. It's probably more rugby than it is hockey, but not a ton of rugby. And it just wasn't something I'd ever been exposed to in any degree as I was growing up and moving through my adult years. And I watched the game with some friends who were hockey umpires, watched a game. I can't remember. And I was like, this is cool. This is fun. I like the speed. 
I can see kind of generally what's happening, but oh, I, I really don't understand the scrum. I don't understand this. I don't understand that. There's no massive call for a sport like rugby to get dumbed down for an ignorant Canadian like me. In fact, what I argue is that it's the complexity of sport that makes it so interesting. Because if you can understand the rules of something very quickly, it probably isn't going to be very interesting for very long. The joy comes from the growth and the learning and the mastery and the intricacies so that there is something for everybody along the sphere. The reason why I'm so obsessed with this sport is that I never feel like I'm even close to mastering it. I can't I, 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 I don't even feel like I'm halfway there to getting the rules. Never mind all the other stuff that can happen. Pardon me, I'm gonna sneeze at some moment, so I might, I might have to pause. Okay, hang on. Okay, we're under control. And one of the things that I think, you know, commentators run into a lot is it'll be, it'll be a World Cup, it'll be an Olympics, and a commentator will be saying, for those of you new to hockey, you need to be five meters away from the ball, or you can't use your feet to, or your body to touch the ball. And they'll explain the most basic rules. Do you have to do that? Do you really have to do that? Because when I watch top football, when I watch any form of sport ball, nobody's dumbing down the rules so that I can catch up. I can understand and learn just by watching and listening to the way that these people are talking about the sport in these complex ways. I can catch on and after a few years, I'll probably get a lot of it. So my vote, <laughs> is no dumbing down of the rules we don't have to do that we can bring everybody up to the level of being amazing hockey fans and every time i have the opportunity to introduce somebody new to the game my friend dina who is moderating in the in the comments today had no idea what field hockey was until she started hanging out with me and we have conversations about rules and she asks intelligent questions and she's able to catch on. All she knows is by watching these streams. You don't need to make it simple, to make it interesting, to make it enjoyable and appeal to the masses. I saw a fantastic video, a talk given by Seth Godin that and if you don't know who Seth Godin is, he's the bald guy with the cool colored glasses and he's an absolute marketing expert. And he makes marketing and he makes business art and craft, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And he was talking about how if you, you market to the average, to the mediocre, to the center of the bell curve, you're gonna be competing down to the lowest common denominator. Hockey, should not do that. We can't compete with the lowest common denominator, which is obviously sport ball. Sport ball. Okay, the sport that everybody knows about and everybody cheers for and it's the most popular sport in the world. We can't compete with that. What we can do is to make our sport more fascinating, more interesting, not to appeal to everybody, but to appeal strongly to the people who can appreciate what it has to offer. And that is the best way to go going forward, I think. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, Simon's back on the last one. It looked like the engaged umpire sought help from the support. Here, let me get off that so it, it feels more like we're 
transporting back in time. Edit. Rewind. Uh, looking for support uh, who had the view. The engaged umpire wasn't behind uh, the defender either, though. He was out on the sideboards. A position that I hate for umpires to be and actually had a side on, so he would have had a pretty good view of the distance. The supporting umpire probably had the worst view, especially if he was doing traditional indoor positioning and he was wide and on the sideboards. He would have been in line with the play. So he wouldn't have been able to see that very well either. So in any event, he made his decision and just sort of corroborated it with his colleague. I've got the whole, yeah, like with the whole video, but there you go. It is a normal shoot. I don't, I don't know. I just don't, just don't. Okay, not today, Satan, not today. You can't confuse me anymore. Okay, back to this magical moment. Chris Palmer, rubbish. It took you way more than two games of playing into hockey to sort of grasp the ruse. <laughs> oh, yeah, almost all of it. Almost all of it except for trapping. Everything else is for safety, and that's why it makes sense, and that's why it's something that we can we can justify and get behind. And there's like a there's a gut feeling and a gut instinct about it. Like if your gut on that drilling play wasn't telling you, then I'm gonna question where is your gut? Did you leave it behind last week? Because you should be cringing if you were that player. If you were that defender, you're closing because you have the confidence that the umpire is going to protect you and that attacker isn't going to take that chance. Because at that standard of play, those should be getting called every damn time. Just saying. Hi, Luke. You just got back from your third game. Oh boy. That's big. Yes, I, I mean, that, that is definitely heavier into the, the purpose behind it. But I also, th there have been many conversations in this context about whether the rules are too complicated. If you want simpler rules, go watch Hockey Fives. Those rules are more simple. Of course, they imply all the complicated rules from the 11-a-side proper format of the game. But you've got this dumbed down, balls always in play notion. You don't, you don't have to call, there's no penalty corners to deal with. And in watching the game, it's boring. I watched a ton of the Youth Olympics when it was on a few years ago, 2018, whenever it was. And yeah, the players had great skill and they were fast, but it wasn't interesting because all of the fun all of the complexity all the tactics totally stripped out so we don't have to appeal to the lowest common denominator the marketplace is big enough for all of us to flourish the world is very very big but if we all try to shoehorn ourselves into this box of average we're going to get into a fight that we will never be able to win because we don't have the TV rights. We don't have the entrenched populations who pass on this game to their kids. We, do, we don't have those advantages. We're behind the eight ball. So what is the best strategy? Show how fucking cool it is. How intellectually engaging it is. how relatively safe it is, given the fact that <laughs> players are running around with weapons and hitting an extremely hard ball at each other. Ask anybody who watches the game for the first time, they're like, what? Why is anybody walking at the end of this game? How do they do it? Jim Gaffigan. There you go. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. Okay. The last one, the last topic here. 
always press the folder button thinking that everything is going to change in my world. And it's not. Okay. Um, so this question popped up, or this scenario popped up, and it's really, really, um, it's not that complicated. But it just goes to show you that there are some misunderstandings about why bullies should be called. And, and in this situation, there was a, uh, the attack had the ball of the D and a rugby ball came and flew on the pitch. Interrupted, safety reasons, couldn't continue. And this person's colleague, after the interruption in play, restarted it with a free hit one meter outside the D. One meter outside the D. And the forward drove in and drove one meter, <laughs> I presume, shot and scored. And the umpire thought it was fair because the attack originally had the ball. Okay. Um, this particular poster, the restart should have been a bully off that's, wow, that's old school wording. That should have been a bully outside the D. Um, he admits that he didn't know where, but would hazard a guess at five meters. Very good guess, sir. You win a prize. Wait. Oh man, I can't even dance. Very good guess, because that is exactly what the rules prescribe. Because of this whole driving straight into the D thing. Okay. So I think that's pretty, uh, pretty simple, you know, not very controversial, but the notion of what you do with a bully, when a team has possession of the ball and you've had to stop play for reasons, uh, can sometimes throw umpires off and can cause situations and Scott who I think is uh who was in the chat maybe he's still around had this happen to him and I know Daniel Marsh has talked about this in the discord server where this happened to him as well where teams agreed and in this case in Scott's case the teams explicitly in in sort of in different language he says the teams agreed that one would pass it back to the other pass it back to the other who did have possession at the time. But then they went in and they competed and they stole it. They stole the ball. What do you do? So we have this agreement um, in situations where play has been stopped and a team is in possession. And here's an example that happened in the EHL where a penalty corner was given and after the umpire consulted with a colleague, she actually confirmed that there was no, uh, that no foul occurred whatsoever. Okay, so they're getting together and they're having their chat. And we have been, we've all been in this situation. Okay, this wasn't a penalty corner play, so we can restart with a bully. This is not a Pibworth rule situation, by the way. Okay. So there's a little bit of confusion once the umpires have corrected the penalty corner decision and decided, okay, it's going to be a bully. And one team uh, thinks that it, the play restarts on the 23. Uh, that's not correct. He steals them all back. It's really, really quite funny. But the correct place is here. And the ball was played back to the team who had possession of the ball inside the attack. Okay, and this is the common sports people's agreement that just didn't happen in this situation. So, of course I gave you a shout out, Daniel. This was a, it's an interesting scenario. Um, and I think, I, well, I'd like to hear your ideas and sort of the way that you would handle, you would manage this situation and whether you think you have any remedies available to you other than sheer scorn and rage okay because I have a couple of ideas one of which wasn't even 
proposed on any of the forum posts that I saw in reply to this. And that's why I was so interested and in why nobody did that one. But so I'll just hang out. I'll wait. Just hanging out. It's one o'clock. I've made it to one o'clock. She's talking to herself in whispers. Okay. <laughs> the constrained hit. <laughs> exactly. It's the constrained hit. It's better than a bully, that's for sure. Okay. Of course I did. Look, I don't understand. I, I don't know the sport, but I can certainly appreciate it. I see highlights and I'm like, that looks cool. I've watched many minutes of a full match and said, I appreciate that. I just don't understand what's happening. But I'm okay with that. I might have decided at some point, I'm going to get into this sport and I'm going to watch it. And... But I was like, oh, I got a better sport. It's not sport ball, it's hockey. The common approach to the ethical play of the bully is not being taught to youth teams in the States. You'd love to see what you described. Well, good news, Lou. That happens within the big white box. You can teach it. You can start spreading the word of this. Because that's what we do is we teach players how to play fairly. Okay, let's see. Nick, <laughs> damn it. How do you just get in here right away and break up all the suspense? Okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna star that because we're gonna come back. I'll see everybody else's ideas. We have a long, long lag. Actually, you're probably all typing a little because you're you're using full words and spelling and I really appreciate that. Uh, Thomas, you had a bully in your Sunday game. You always just lightly step on the ball so the umpire can give it the other team a free hit. Well, that's interesting. That's a very, um, that's a very generous and fair thing to do. I would hate to see an umpire misinterpret that and decide that they're gonna call you for an intentional foot. But did it break down play? No, it did not. Why not call the team, call out the team and add the word really? Really, with Seth Myers and Amy Poehler. Um, may make them feel ashamed for the lack of sports manship. Um, Yeah, okay, but call them out. Like, what would you do? What exactly does calling them out mean to you, Stain? Leeds in sport ball let the opponent score a free goal when they scored when they should have given the ball back after an injury. Interesting. So you're saying in a sport ball match, a sport ball game, that a goal was scored that the team realized that they shouldn't have when they should have given the ball back. So they let the other team score. Fascinating. I wouldn't have expected that from sport ball. I, I'm watching you, McDowell. When a team uh, goes and decides to contest a bully when they have no moral right to, the games usually turn ugly. Right, that's a good point, Daniel. We do have a responsibility in this situation. So this is very different, very, very different from the whole teams not playing and having a static standoff as we saw in the Ender case, because between the two opponents in that game right there, something unfair has happened. The thing that happened in that indoor game was between another team that wasn't even part of the game, outside the big, whatever color the lines are, and the boards in indoor in that particular situation, outside that big box, or an outdoor big white box. Luke, insisting a proper bully and not letting the teams decide that they will play. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do that. But this is a convention that has emerged. Actually, I think it's been around for quite a long time. You'll see it at, exhibited, you know, regularly, just like we saw it in, in that EHL clip that I showed. You'll see it in 
those kind of contacts. I'll show you another clip where the bully, where it, at, attack didn't have the ball, but it it was from a circle play. Actually, the attack did have possession of the ball. During the penalty corner, this is before the Pibworth rule came in, friends. Just so you know. Okay. And I think the first thing that you have to know is that we're going to set it aside at this moment. Is that it should have been another penalty corner for the Netherlands. Okay. And because the Australian defender deflected it up dangerously and hit the Dutch attacker in the head. Okay. We don't need to talk about that part. Um, so they needed to, under the current rules at the time, I think this is 20, is this 2018? I can't remember, maybe 2019, but before the Pibworth rule came in, that the, um, because that was in December 2020. So the bully gets called, and there is no agreement. Okay. And the, the, the teams fully contest the bully. Or contested enough. It doesn't seem like um, Jody Kenny really gave that much of an up, but she was still there, and she was just she was ready to stop the Dutch from getting back into the circle as much as she could. Again, because the two teams were like this, and to me, there was a sense of frustration in that moment because the attacking team didn't get what they wanted. The defenders were like, too bad. This is contest, this is fully competitive. And then you have that emerge. It doesn't feel good, Luke. It doesn't, it doesn't accord with the way that we expect teams to treat each other in those circumstances. So not a big fan. Yes, it's cute. Call the team's name. Okay. But you're absolutely right. I'm not sure about this calling the team's name. So I was like, Phoenix. Okay, my club team's name is Phoenix. So I was like, Phoenix. I don't know what that would achieve other than making me look like I'm drawing attention to the fact that I'm powerless, which isn't a fact. Um, but you're absolutely right. You can't, well, their conduct isn't against the rules. But I'd argue about whether the team, whether you have any ability to blow the whistle or not. Okay, you set the players up and reminded them on a five meter outside the circle bully how to play. The teams played the best they could and everybody's happy. Yeah, that's, that's an important, <laughs> yes. Yes, the man has a, pre, you know, it's like a PP. It's a pre pebworth There you go. An umpire could pretend that they didn't restart their clock and ask for a retake. See, now, now we're thinking outside the big white box. I like it. Um, Luke, is a team not allowed to contest a bully if one team wants to allow the other team to start with the ball? Uh, okay, hang on. You're challenging me here today. Damn you, Pibworth. Damn you. Um, if one team wants to allow the other team to start with the ball, knowing that they'll pass back, they can only do that because a bully is meant to be two players. Um, well, it, you, you do need to have the, the two players, you, you need to have the tap, okay? So the, the, the bully requires that there is a stick tap, but one of the players does not have to attempt to play the ball. But generally, the way that it's, it's agreed upon is that the team who is fourth, who is generously and, and with good sports, um, who is forfeiting the possession of the ball, will be the one to hit it into the, you know, backwards. Because just giving it up, you know, immediately right there in that spot, that's a bit much. That's a bit much to ask anybody to give. Um, a goal should be disallowed because no, tra oh yeah, of course. Like that, that whole, that whole situation, 
is a lot of wrong. There's so much wrong going on in there. It's just a big pile of steaming wrongness. And we like this. But I just wanted to illustrate that these scenarios come up because bullies are rare and we need to have strategies. We need to know what the rules are. We need to know where, why we call the bully, why we don't call the bully because we know the Pibworth rule, why, um, why we take it to the five meter dash if something has happened inside that or inside the circle. Why do we do that? And how do we proactively communicate with teams? And then what do we do if they're complete jerk faces like this? Okay, two ideas. Two ideas, and one that, that Daniel raised is, is simply to restart it. And you can make up any reason you want. Maybe your colleague wasn't ready. Maybe you had something in your eye. Maybe your, your shoelace isn't tied. Hey, gang, 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 sorry, sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm just, you know, mm, I gotta fix that. And you go to the team, you go, you do that again. Pop those angry eyes in. The other possibility. Okay, I, w I worked through this a little bit. Was the potential of giving a card. Because it, you can't give a free hit because it is not an offense that has been detailed in the rules. An offense being defined as an action against an opponent contrary to the rules, which may be penalized by an umpire. You might say to me, but Keeley, section 14.1 is very clear. It says for any offense, the offending player may be green carded, cautioned, warned, yellow carded, red carded. So why can we give cards for dissent? Because we can. We just can. Dissent is not an offense against an opponent. There is nothing in the rules that say that you can't abuse an umpire. I'm ignoring the, sh the stuff that happens after rule 14, guys, okay? Because all that stuff in the guidance is merely guidance. It's good guidance sometimes, sometimes it's bad, but it's guidance. So what we're looking at is our conventional understanding that umpires have the ability to card players for misconduct-like things that impugn the character of the game. There's nothing in the rules that says you can't utter a homophobic slur, but I'll slap a red card on anybody I hear doing that. Racism. transphobia, other forms of abuse against an identifiable group. It's not in the rules. Watch me give a red card for that. So I could let play continue and at the next moment where I'm able to stop time at the next offense or ball goes out of play, I'll card that player. I think I'd be looking at a five minute yellow. Because that is rude. If you are certain that an accord has been reached between those players, not just an inference, but you are certain that there has been a meeting of the minds and one of those parties decided to breach that contract, yeah. I think you can card them. I do like the uh, just resetting the play for some other reason. You could you could reset the bully because it was taken in the wrong place. So, oh, gang, gang, nope, my bad. It's actually five meters over this way. So there's a lot of things that you can do with that in, in that range of creativity, but you better be a pretty good you better be very confident that you can carry that. I'm not saying that you have to be a great actor, but you have to have confidence. And 
the, the knowledge that you could back it up with that personal penalty if you got into that situation again. Oh my God, don't even get me started with about the bad syntax. Ian, good to see you, friend. Um, it's, a, it's a wrong fest. Can I see that? Um, didn't Carol, Carolina Del Fuente call for a bully when the goalkeeper had taken on a tactic but ended up at a free hit because the opponent didn't want to compete? Um, maybe? It's been a while. I'd have to look for that. Um, Thomas, by next reason, the retake... Would it be because they defied an official instruction because you told them to do something, they have to do it? Well, the way that it was framed, I think, was that the teams had agreed, not that the umpire had said, you're going to do this. And if that, if that was the case, I would be even more insistent. I would be more prone to be saying, excuse me, we just talked about this. And like Daniel said, that kind of cheater pants behavior is going to cause problems in a game if you don't deal with it. And that is all the justification I think that you need. Okay, you can't make up your own rules, but you can certainly govern forms of misconduct because none of them are defined. Look at all the things that you can do. You're not ever going to abuse your power. But this, you will. After an injury, you've agreed with the captains that it would happen in a sporting way, as you've talked about, but then the message hadn't got through to one of the players taking the bully. Yeah, and that's for you, as the umpire, <laughs> responsible to make sure that message gets across to the right person. <coughs> so you don't want to be in a position where you've given a captain an instruction make it very patently clear to the player who is approaching the ball. Say, yeah, you got this? Do you understand what's happening here? Does everybody understand what's happening here? This team's getting the ball and all. I mean, and, and this is like, like Lou was saying earlier, it's not something that, that, you know, the hockey community and the culture in the United States has cottoned on to. It's not super popular up here in Canada either. So you do have to do some work. But again, this is part of your job, your authority. And I will make the instruction very clear. I will make it very public. And I'll be like, so the ball's going that way, right? And I'll look at, at the players who it's probably going to be passed to and say, yeah, the ball's coming to you. Wait for my, wait for my time in. And I'll look at the player who's going to be responsible for hitting the ball back to them. I'll say, you got this? It's going to go back there, right? And then the player who's opposing the bully and say, you're going to let them hit the ball back there, right? Like you just make it so clear. I can't, I can't even imagine after doing all that. So the proactivity is really important. But if you have to get to the point where you have to card a player because they've they figured that they were going to be able to get away with cheating like that and be in a jerk face. I'd, I'd play my rant of the week if I thought it was going to work. But I've already used it up as well. Um, Daniel, what you recently discovered about your incident, if I hit the right button, is the player contested bully wasn't naive about bullies like they claimed. He was an umpire? Oh, no. Shame. Shame. You like that. They haven't broken the rule, but they've gone against the spirit of the game. Yes. The proactivity, Shane, absolutely very good. You explain to the two bullies what your expectation, <laughs> two of the bullies, explain to the two bullies what you expect. The two players contesting, setting up the bully, what your expectation of the fair play is. Yeah. It works most of the time. And again, your culture in your area, the, the savviness of the players, the temperament of the game that you've been dealing with, you might need to be crystal clear with players who uh, are in a game where they're just like red mist because they're just in such a competitive situation. They're not thinking very rationally. 
take the time to help make that a bit more. There you go, Nick. <laughs> Strictly incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's doubt, if there's doubt, that's the card I'd pull. The oops, the oopsie card. But if I'm certain... Thank you, Nick. Well done. Uh, you don't just talk to the captains, talk to the people involved. Yep. That's the one. So how would you do that? Reset and card or wait till the next break? I would... I would wait until the next break. Because the reset is an opportunity for them to do it right. The card is, oh no, you're not interested in doing it right. You can go sit down and think about what you've done. Go over there. Gareth, hi. Something's very true in Wellington. Okay. Right, gang. <laughs> Just like I thought. I'm like eight minutes short of my usual and Boy, am I hurting. I cannot wait to get some tea into me, take off these lashes, and get into bed and sleep for a while. I didn't sleep very well last night. Luke, uh, other games, sports ball, well played. Board games, etc. players can be ejected from the match turn if they're found to be cheating. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Eject them tempor temporarily. I don't think it's, it's worth any more than that. Um, but yeah, I'd be looking at five with that level of intention. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I have a button for this. <laughs> oh, it's behind Simon's, Simon's missive. Let me, let me press it again. Cause it's really good. Wait, how do I remove from broadcast by pressing that button? And then I press this button again. Look, look what I built. Mm. Yes, if you wouldn't mind, if you enjoyed what happened today and you got likes out of the- Oh, look at that! I saw I, I saw some people hitchhiking! The thumbs just started like flying out of the comments section. Thank you very much. And uh, don't forget again about the control elevator. If you're thinking about it, you've, you've only got um, eight days to register. And I might, I might have to cap it if it gets too full, but we're, don't worry, we're not, we're not super close to there. But uh, yeah, don't forget about that. And think about the third team. If you, if you want, if you want, if you have questions about it. Oh yeah, Discord. This is where we're at. This is where all the fun stuff happens. Mm. There are gifts. There's an off topic area where everybody can squirrel their little hearts out. People are even putting those damn Wordle posts in there. Oh, do you know how hard it is for me just to go, okay, fine. Go Wordle your Wordleness. In my server. <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. Um, but it's a great place to meet other members of the community. We talk as a group. I run all the mentoring that we do. The course is happening there. It's a great spot. So please, if you haven't already joined, come over to the Discord. And yeah, I think I think that's just about it. I'll just make sure that we've got all the other um, <laughs> all the other comments taken care of. Temp is fine, but chat messages. Are... <laughs> yeah, totally fair. Thank you. Because of oos, you press it nicely. Oh, okay. Well, aren't you? Just so careful. Yeah, nobody is forcing you to slap the like button. You can always just give it a gentle little friendly tap, a little doop. That's totally fine. Yes, join the squirrels. <laughs> They're all there. Yes, this is the address for the uh, control library workshop. Dina, thanks for sticking around. Appreciate it. There you go. Um, I, I hope, I really hope so too. It's been, um, Things aren't, things aren't trending the right way with this whole thing. I've been sick since Friday, so not great. And yes, I, I told my dad, I was, on a, I was on a FaceTime call with him on Monday, which was his actual birthday. He turned 80. If you're not my Facebook friend, you wouldn't know that. Oh, but yes, he turned 80 and uh, he's not on Facebook. 
<laughs> Mostly because he's like, no, Facebook doesn't deserve me. We're related. You may be able to figure that out. But I told him that uh, I was gonna snap all the comments and I was gonna send them to him because I said a whole bunch of total strangers are gonna wish you happy birthday and you're gonna love it. And I'm not gonna lie, he kind of got a little excited. He's like, really? Yeah, people think that you're pretty awesome because you created this. <laughs> and he was like, okay. He's getting soft in his old age, friends. This was not possible even 20 years ago, trust me. There you go. Thank you. I will do my best. I appreciate everything as well. And yes, appreciate that late night work. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday if you live in the future like our Kiwi friends. And I look forward to seeing you on the Discord server in the next week. Thank you very much, Mr. Pibworth. I do. Yes. All right. Have a fantastic one. Oh, this is going to be a challenge. I have the wrong button. I can do this though. I can do this. I messed up my stream deck, but I got it. Okay. Have a good one. Bye.